This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. We'd like to let you know that the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii will be celebrating its 20th anniversary during the coming year. From a handful of pioneering founders back in 1990 to becoming one of the largest vegetarian organizations in the nation, we've continued to promote health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. We hope you enjoy this evening's lecture, and we hope that everyone will take a look at our free literature table. If you're not a member, we'd like to encourage you to join tonight. The discounts you'll get from the vegetarian-friendly restaurants and natural food stores down, such as Down to Earth will more than pay for your membership, and you'll receive an informative newsletter as well. Your membership dues and donations, including any you may have made tonight as you came in, and thank you very much for that, help to make possible events like this, and you'll also be helping to promote a healthful and compassionate lifestyle for people in Hawaii and throughout the world. The refreshments tonight are courtesy of Down to Earth Natural Foods. We hope you'll stay after the talk and enjoy some of these delicious vegan refreshments. Tonight's lecture is being videotaped for broadcast on the VSH weekly TV series, Vegetarian. On Oahu, the program airs on Thursdays at 6 p.m. on Olelo Channel 52. We also welcome you to view many of our previous lectures online at our website, vsh.org, where you'll find a wealth of information and resources. Tonight's lecture will be added to the website soon. It is now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight Jack Norris, RD. Mr. Norris co-founded Vegan Outreach in 1993 and is currently the president. Vegan Outreach produces the booklet, Why Vegan?, among many others, and has distributed over 10 million copies to date. Jack runs Vegan Outreach's Adopt a College program, which has directly handed a vegan outreach brochure to over 3 million students since it started in the fall of 2003. Jack is a registered dietitian. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Nutrition and Dietetics from the Life University in Marietta, Georgia in 2000 and performed a dietetic internship at Georgia State University in 2000 to 2001. Jack is the author of Vitamin B12, Are You Getting It?, Staying Healthy on Plant-Based Diets, and other health articles found at veganhealth.org and jacknorrisrd.com. This evening, Mr. Norris will present Vegan Nutrition, What Does the Science Say? Please welcome Jack Norris. Hawaiian welcome. So nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Thank you to the Hawaiian Vegetarian Society for having me here. I've only been to Hawaii one other time, and um, it's just really amazing. It's hard to believe people get to live here year-round. I was also invited by the Northern Michigan Vegetarian Society to speak this weekend, and I, I think I chose wisely. Okay, so my talk tonight is what does the science say? Before I get into it too much, I want to say a few things about Vegan Outreach. This is our website, veganoutreach.org. And we have a, a free weekly e-newsletter that comes out every Wednesday. If you're interested in signing up for it, you can just click right here if you go to our website. And it, it gives a lot of updates on what's happening in the vegan world. So please do that if you're interested. What Vegan Outreach is most known for is our pamphlet, Why Vegan?, which we distribute. And we also have a few other booklets that are very similar to it, but have a slightly different tone. And we deliver, as Lorraine mentioned, we hand them out to college students. In the last couple of years, 
we've been giving, handing about 500,000 to college students every semester at over 500 colleges normally. I asked them to pass out this, um, this uh, booklet, A Meaningful Life. I don't know if everyone got one, but if you didn't, please grab one at the table over there if you're interested. It's about the vegan outreach philosophy of activism and veganism and that sort of thing. and gives you tips on how to uh, deal with family and friends if you're having problems with them, what you can do to help animals if you're interested. We also have an expanded version of this pamphlet uh, by, written by my co-founder of Vegan Outreach, Matt Ball, uh, along with Bruce Friedrich of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And this book is just $10 on our website if you're interested. A lot of people have, uh, that have read it said that it has really helped them deal with family and friends again and, and uh, activism. Finally, I have this guide to cruelty-free eating, which I uh, has in it an article called Staying Healthy on Plant-Based Diets. It follows along with my talk to a large extent, and it lists all the nutrition recommendations I'm going to give, with one small exception, which I will point out when I get to it, so you don't need to write anything down. You so what I want to do is examine the role of vegetarian diets in preventing chronic disease as it's been measured in studies looking directly at vegetarians, and then review the nutritional concerns of vegan diets especially, but also to some extent, lacto-ovo-vegetarian -ovo diets. So the way that we have a lot of information about lacto-ovo-vegetarians and vegans is through five large cohort studies that have been performed on them. And a cohort study means that you get a group of people together, generally healthy people with different diets, and then you follow them over time. You, you measure the diet every few years that, that they're eating to make sure they're still eating the same diet, and then you see what sort of disease incidences they have and then compare them to each other. And that's really, I think, the, one of the best ways, anyway, we have to determine what a vegetarian diet actually does for you and what it doesn't. A number of these studies were finished around the year 2000 and, and before. Four. But right now, Epic Oxford and Adventist Health 2, these two bottoms studies, are, are currently ongoing. Up through this study, Oxford Vegetarian, there were only a total of 760 vegans studied. But Epic Oxford has 2,000 and Adventist Health 2 has 3,000. And that's going to be a lot more helpful in getting information about vegans than what we have had so far. The first bit of information that we got on vegetarian mortality was in 1999. There was a meta-analysis released looking at the combined results of the top uh, four, or was it five, studies I had shown on, on the previous slide. And it showed that vegetarians had 24% less heart disease than regular meat eaters. It also showed that vegans had 26% less heart disease than regular meat eaters. In other words, people who eat meat more than one, times a week, one time a week. But that finding was not statistically significant, meaning that it could have been due to random chance. But it was a trend very similar to the larger group of vegetarians. So there's, I think, good reason to think that, that it was a fairly accurate view of, of a vegan diet. Uh, but we will find out soon when more, more research comes out on vegan diets. The vegetarians had the same rates of cancer and total mortality as the non-vegetarians, which was a, a somewhat disappointing result. Uh, that's in, to some extent, that could be possible due to just not having enough people or, or following them for long enough time uh, because it, you, it takes a great deal, of, a, a very high number of people to, to find statistically significant results for cancer. It's just a lot less common than heart disease. What they did in these studies, though, is they performed what's called standardized mortality rates in which they compared the overall population, which was all the vegetarians, all the vegans, all the meat eaters, to the greater population. What happens often is that healthier people volunteer for studies, and in this case they found out that this was true, that the, the people in these studies overall had only half the rate of mortality, and that is deaths uh, be, before the age of 90, than the greater population. So these were very healthy people, and so the vegetarians having the same rates of cancer, that was compared to, to people with somewhat low rates of cancer. Now the Adventist Health Study, and one reason that Seventh-day Adventists are studied is that they promote vegetarianism to their members, and a large proportion of them are vegetarian, and I think more recently are becoming vegan. And the good thing about it is that they, they have very low rates of smoking and, and alcohol consumption, so you can kind of weed out that variable more easily and see what difference is the diet making, because they have such similar lifestyles, and not just the drinking and smoking, but in other ways also. We found that the vegetarian women live two and a half years longer and the vegetarian men live three years longer among these Adventists. Hypertension and diabetes was 50% less for the vegetarians and rheumatoid arthritis was 25% less. 
now I'm going to talk a little bit about disease markers, and these studies are cross-sectional, which means that it was just a slice in time at, at, at what the, these vegetarians' cholesterol levels were. In other words, they didn't follow people over time to see what happened to their cholesterol levels. But in any case, what I did was I took all the studies from 1980 through 2003, and I did this back in 2003, that measured vegans' cholesterol levels, and I averaged them all out. NV is non-vegetarians. The number here is how many were, were, were measured. These are people who eat no meat except for fish. These are lacto-ovo vegetarians. And we found that the vegans had a, a cholesterol level of 160 uh, compared to 185 and then 202 for the non-vegetarians. So they're doing, vegans obviously are having have a much lower level of cholesterol. And the big difference was in the LDL cholesterol. The LDL is the bad cholesterol and the HDL is thought to be good cholesterol. And the 50, you want a higher HDL, and the vegans had a lower, but, it, but what's most important is the total cholesterol ratio to HDL. I need to stop doing And that was 3.1 for the vegans versus 3.7 for the non-vegetarians, which was a good finding. So there's nothing to worry about that the vegans had a lower HDL cholesterol. The vegans also had a lower triglyceride level, which was an interesting finding because if you l listen to a lot of the people that promote low-carbohydrate diets, they say that, low carbo that high carbohydrate diets raise triglyceride levels. And in some uh, controlled studies, that is true. But among free living vegans, we can see that it actually isn't. So one, only one study has looked at the percentage of vegans with high blood pressure compared to other groups. And it found that for men, only 6% of the vegans had high blood pressure versus 15% for the non-vegetarians. And the women had a similar finding with 8% versus 12%. So that was a good finding. That was statistically significant. In the last few years, anyway, there have been two large studies done on body mass index. Body mass index is a measurement of weight in relation to height, and it gives you an estimate of whether someone is uh, too heavy or not, but it, it can be influenced by someone who's very muscular, which could throw off the results. But generally, that hasn't been a problem for these studies. It, it all averages out. What has been traditionally thought is that a BMI between 20 and 25 is the most healthy a BMI above of 25 to 30 is considered overweight, and then over 30 is considered obese. And more recently, there's been a theory that maybe people with a BMI below 22.5 and then especially below 20, that may not be a good thing necessarily because of their lower fat-free mass. In the past, we've always known that people uh, with BMIs less than 20 had higher rates of mortality but it was always thought to be due to uh, undiagnosed disease and smoking-related diseases that were not found upon entry into these studies. But they're actually finding that, that as they, they measure for these variables, it, the finding doesn't go away. So, and the reason I bring that up is that I think in the vegan movement we often have an idea that there's no way to get too thin. I mean, there's, of course, you can get extremely, extremely too thin that, that we would agree is not good. But generally, there's no way to. And I think that maybe we need to rethink that a bit and, and see if maybe, I think especially maybe a little bit higher protein might help increase the fat-free mass of some vegans so that we're not too thin. But these are, I think, somewhat preliminary findings. It's been studied a lot, but it takes a lot of studies to really find conclusive evidence of these things. Anyway, the vegan BMI in this Adventist Health Study 2 is right in the middle of what's considered healthy, and the non-vegetarian was in the overweight range. And the lacto-ovo vegetarian was actually in the overweight range as well, which is the first time I'd ever seen that in a study. But that's the most recent findings. And then this other one, the, uh, the other largest study in recent years was Epic Oxford in 2003. And they had a similar finding with the vegans right in the middle of a healthy BMI and the non-vegetarians on average significantly higher. They're not overweight in this case. Okay, then there was one cross-sectional study that has looked at type 2, uh, rates of type 2 diabetes in vegans, and this was a very good finding, and not a surprising one at all, but it was the first time it was actually measured. I think we've thought for years that a vegan diet has been a way to prevent type 2 diabetes. And there have been studies by PCRM treating people with type 2 diabetes with a, a vegan diet that have been very effective, but it hasn't been looked at in terms of preventative. This was just released this year, and they found that uh, they actually broke it down into even further diet groups than normal. So we've got the vegan, lacto-ovo, fish eaters, and then semi-vegetarians, which are people who eat meat more than once a month but less than once a week. And then the non-vegetarians eat meat weekly or more. I have two findings up here. The first one, the top ratio, was when they uh, 
adjusted for the body mass index. And when they did that, they found that vegans had 50% as much type 2 diabetes as non-vegetarians. But I don't think, I think it was good that they did that adjustment, but I think a more accurate adjustment of what the vegan diet can do for you is the adjustment for without the BMI, because the vegan diet probably does influence body mass index. So if you, if you take out the adjustment for the BMI, the vegans had only 30% of the type 2 diabetes as non-vegetarians. Basically, vegans have very low rates of type 2 diabetes in the cross-sectional study. It'll be interesting to see if we, we find that when following vegans over time as well, which I wouldn't be surprised if we do. I certainly hope so. Okay, so in terms of looking at cancer, there have been a number of studies that have compared rates of lacto-ovo vegetarians to meat eaters, and just recently in 2009, Epic, the, the Epic Oxford study released uh, findings about uh, vegetarians, which included vegans and lacto-ovo vegetarians, compared to people who only eat fish, I'm sorry, people who don't eat meat except for fish, compared to regular meat eaters. And they found that the vegetarians and the fish eaters had about 80% of the, the overall cancer rates as the regular meat eaters. Although you can't say that they had necessarily lower rates than meat eaters since fish is meat and the fish eaters also had low rates. The top part was that other, three other studies have compared all cancer rather than breaking it down into separate types of cancer in vegetarians compared to meat eaters, and they found no difference in the results. As for prostate cancer, one study has found lower rates in vegetarians. Three studies have found no difference between the two diet groups. In colorectal cancer, it was lower in vegetarians in one study. In another study, it was lower in people who had been vegetarian for more than 20 years, but no different for current vegetarians. And then in three other studies, there were no difference. There were no studies that showed higher rates of colorectal cancer for uh, vegetarians. Okay, for breast cancer, there were five studies that have shown no difference. And one study has shown higher rates of breast cancer. It was not, it did not adjust for having no children, and women who have not had children are at a higher risk for breast cancer. So that could be part of the reason that this was found, and also vegetarians tend to have less children than non-vegetarians. So that could explain some of it. And the finding was barely significant, so I don't think it's anything to worry about at all, and certainly five studies have not found a difference. Lung cancer, there's been seven studies that have looked at it, and there's been no difference. And then there have been other studies that have looked at, at smaller, less common types of cancer, and they've been, there just hasn't been enough really to report here. So to sum up what I've just been talking about, in the words of the American Dietetic Association that just released another position paper on vegetarian diets in 2009, they are the most mainstream nutrition body in the United States and possibly the world. And they, and, you know, endorse to some extent. They don't tell people that they should go vegetarian, but they certainly have a, a positive position on it. And they say that a vegetarian diet can help prevent disease, as this top paragraph says. And then they say that a well-planned vegetarian diet, including a vegan diet, are appropriate for individuals during all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, and adolescence, as well as for athletes. So if people tell you that you can't be vegetarian, and I still hear that, Pretty frequently, you can point to the American Dietetic Association's position. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some of the nutritional concerns of uh, vegans and lacto-ovo vegetarians. In this case, of uh, vitamin B12 is the most important one, and it is mostly for vegans, although some lacto-ovo vegetarians don't have uh, the greatest vitamin B12 levels. Anyone who, who eats the fewer animal products you eat, the more important vitamin B12 becomes. So it's not just for people who are strictly vegan. Okay, so plant foods do not naturally contain vitamin B12, and that's why it's an issue for vegans. And there are two types of B12 deficiency. One is what I call overt B12 deficiency, and that is when you develop, your B12 levels get extremely low, you develop nerve and blood problems, you'll get a, a, a macrocytic anemia, you can start developing tingling in your fingers and toes, and if you don't catch it and do something about it, you can become, it can lead to death, actually, eventually. It can often be caught once you have tingling in the fingers and toes. It can be reversed, and there will be no permanent damage, but the longer you let it go, the more likely it is to cause permanent damage. So it's not something to mess with, and I will get more 
in a, to it in a second about how to, to prevent any problems. Then the other type of vitamin B12 deficiency, which we've just started learning about in this decade, the year 2000 is when these papers started coming out that have shown that vegans have had high levels of homocysteine. Homocysteine is thought to be toxic to nerves and blood vessels, and it is a byproduct of methionine metabolism, which is an amino acid that's found commonly in proteins. What happens is that if you don't have enough B12, your body can't get rid of the homocysteine. And high levels of homocysteine have been linked to heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, and early death. Now, I don't think that it is, well, uh, it has not been conclusively proven that homocysteine is the things causing these, these things. There could be another thing that's going on that parallels the homo- high homocysteine levels that are causing these. But until we know that, I think it's important to, to really pay attention to this. So I want to show some studies that have measured the homocysteine levels of vegans. And these were all the studies up through 2003 that did it. After a while, I got tired of adding them to the slide. But they all pretty much show the same thing. These are vegans who do not supplement for the most part. And you can see that the vegan B12 levels are all lower than the the vegetarians and non-vegetarians. Now, that's nothing surprising at all. We've always known that the vegans who don't supplement are going to have lower B12 levels. But if you look at homocysteine levels in these same people, you will see that the vegans have much higher homocysteine levels, whereas the lacto-vegetarians have have the next highest and the non-vegetarians have the lowest. Now, a homocysteine level above 10 to 15 is where you start getting associated with those diseases I, I mentioned earlier, and then above 15 is really where there is a concern. Here is a study in 1998 in which people were supplementing with vitamin B12 and the vegans. And here is a study from 98 where the vegans were taking vitamin B12 and a study from 99 where the vegans were taking vitamin B12. And you can see that their homocysteine levels are very well within the healthy range, which is like four to eight. Four is extremely low. It's pretty, I don't, it's pretty hard to get lower than four. So all you have to do is take vitamin B12 and your homocysteine levels should be fine. Okay, so there's a number of myths about what foods contain vitamin B12. And th- the reason that these myths exist to some extent, some, some of it is just people making things up. But another thing is that the, the way that you measure vitamin B12 in animal products is using a, a measure that's appropriate for animal products because animal products contain mostly active vitamin B12. But there are a lot of molecules that are very similar to vitamin B12 that are not active for humans. And these measurements cannot discern between them very well. And so what happens is that the companies use these crude methods to to measure their plant products. And what they are often finding in many times is inactive vitamin B12 analogs, but they still promote their food as having vitamin B12 because it's, it's like... Uh, there's no regulation telling them they can't do it. Some of the things that cannot be relied upon, blue-green algae, which includes spirulina, and super blue-green algae, which is distributed by Celtech, a um, multi-level marketing company. You may have heard of it. I'm not sure. And then seaweeds like nori and chlorella, they cannot be relied on for vitamin B12. Fermented foods like tempeh. Now, in some countries, a tempeh starter may be contaminated with vitamin B12-producing bacteria, and that is how B12 is made, by bacteria. But the, temp, the, the starter for tempeh does not require those bacteria, so it's also very easy to have tempeh without such bacterial bacteria. And so if there is vitamin B12 in any tempeh, it's from contamination. Now, none of the tempehs in the U.S. have ever found any inactive or active vitamin B12 analogs in tempeh, but in some foreign countries they have found some at least vitamin B12 analogs, so they've never really been tested to determine, tested accurately to determine whether they were active or inactive. Brewer's yeast and unfortified nutritional yeast, they do not, they cannot be relied upon for vitamin B12. Fortified nutritional yeast can. Organic foods and intestinal bacteria also can't be relied upon. Okay, so here's my suggestions for vitamin B12. Either take three to five micrograms a day from fortified foods in at least two servings per day. Your body can only absorb so much B12 at once in small amounts, such as three to five micrograms. Once you get into a little bit higher amounts, like 10 to 100 micrograms, you can take just one a day or 1,000 micrograms twice a week chewed well. 
is a, another way to get enough vitamin B12. And so there, there's basically two ways that your body absorbs B12. One is through a system where proteins pick up the B12 and they transport it for you into your bloodstream. And then there's another way of just overwhelming your cell membranes with vitamin B12 and some of it just passively gets through into your blood. And that's why you can get it from such large doses. Okay, so the next thing is omega-3 fatty acids. So there are short-chain omega-3s and long-chain omega-3s. And the plant omega-3s, which, are, which is called ALA, or alpha-linolenic acid, found in flax seeds, walnuts, canola oil, and hemp seeds, and chia and a few other, other foods that are not as common, they uh, need to be converted into longer-chain omega-3s by your body in order to become the EPA and DHA that you find in fish. The fish get it from seaweed, and so you can also get EPA and DHA for, from seaweed. And in like the last year and a half, I think, uh, there is a company now that is, has, a, has an, a vegan EPA on the market, and there has been vegan DHA supplements for quite a number of years now and that, that are made from seaweed. What these omega-3s do is they reduce inflammation, blood clotting, and cholesterol levels, and DHA in particular prevents depression, or another way to say that is that if you get too low in DHA, you could become depressed. The problem, unfortunately, is that your body has to convert them, and some people's bodies do not convert them very efficiently. Okay, so then one other thing about conversion is that DHA can be converted into EPA. And so because of this, I've changed my recommendations recently, and since that Guide to Cruelty Free Eating was put out, to suggest that vegans should probably take a DHA supplement on a somewhat regular basis just to make sure you're getting it. And the older you get, the less efficient your body is at converting these. So it's more important for older people probably to do this. I'm going to get a little into that a little bit more in a second, but the other, there's another side to this coin of omega-3s, and that is omega-6s. And I'm sorry this chart is somewhat complicated, but I will uh, just want to show it because it illustrates why it's important to reduce omega-6 fatty acids. And omega-6 fatty acids are very common in plant oils. Like I just talked about what plants have omega-3s, and they were fairly obscure plant foods that people are not getting a whole lot of except for walnuts. But omega-6s are found in just about all plant oils, and vegans tend to get very high amounts of omega-6. A good ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 is 1 to 4, and vegans tend to be above 1 to 10 and all the way to 1 to 15 in some studies. Now, the reason that this is a problem is that the same enzyme that converts the, the short-chain omega-3 to the long-chain omega-3s is the same enzyme that converts short-chain omega-6s to long-chain omega-6s. And up here is the omega-3s threes getting converted and down here is the omega, omega sixes and this is the enzyme doing it and if you overwhelm this enzyme with omega six then it can't convert the omega three so it's important that vegans reduce their intake of omega sixes as well as increase their intake of omega threes so these are my recommendations for omega threes is two to three hundred milligrams of dha per day i don't think it's necessary to do that every single day or to be the evidence isn't overwhelming that vegans must do this every day but i think it's a good idea to do so then avoid omega-6, which is corn, soy, safflower, sunflower, anything called vegetable oil, as well as sesame oil. Instead, use olive, peanut, avocado, or canola oil, which are low in omega-6s. Only cook canola oil under low heat for short periods because heat does damage omega-3s. The good thing about canola is, and I know there's some bad things about it environmentally, but the good thing about it is it's high in monounsaturated fats, and it's also hot. it also has a, a large amount of omega-3s. So you're, it's low in omega-6 and high in omega-3s, as well as fla uh, flaxseed is very low in omega-6 as well. So then I recommend if you're taking DHA each day or, or regularly, I recommend you still try to get half a gram of uncooked alpha-linolenic acid into your diet daily by doing one of the following here, eating uh, some walnuts, only three halves of walnuts is, is enough for, to get this amount, a quarter teaspoon of flaxseed oil, a teaspoon of canola oil, or a teaspoon of ground flaxseeds. Not too hard to do, but you have to make a point of doing it. So vitamin D is not much of a problem in most, if you live in Hawaii, probably, because I imagine most people get out in the sun, and uh, you can always, the sun's always strong here, and so all you have to do is get out in the sun for 10 or 15 minutes a day without sunscreen on, because sunscreen blocks vitamin D production, and if you do that, you will get plenty of vitamin D. Now, just in case, I just want to inform people, if, if you don't live in Hawaii, what you need to do, because vitamin D deficiency is pretty common on the U.S. mainland. 
A high percentage, recent research has shown that a high percentage of people have mild vitamin D deficiency, and those diseases are linked with a lot of autoimmune disease and other diseases that you can see listed. So because of that, I recommend that if you do not get in the sun every day, uh, 10 to 15 minutes if you have light skin, 20 minutes if you have dark skin, 30 minutes if you're elderly, because elderly people do not convert vitamin D very well in their skin without sunscreen, then you should take 1,000 international units of vitamin D2. Vitamin D2 is vegan. Vitamin D3 is not. Unfortunately, this amount of vitamin D re does require supplements. It cannot. They, there's no multivitamin that has that much vitamin D, and there's no fortified food. Uh, but Country Life makes a very cheap, common supplement that you can get in, in uh, most health food stores of vitamin D2. Now, I've met a lot of vegans that have had problems, such as the ones I listed before, like just bones hurt and pain and fatigue and a lot being about four that I've worked with. And after getting either in the sun, usually this, taking the supplements, they have uh, felt tremendously better and have felt that they were cured of whatever was, was happening to them. So it can be a problem for vegans. And so that's why I, think I make a big point to making sure people know about it. So the RDA for, is only 200 international units, and that's way less than the 1,000 I recommended. And there is a large number of vitamin D researchers that think the RDA should be increased, though that is somewhat controversial, and I guess we'll see the next time they update the RDA for vitamin D whether they're going to increase it or not. And there is a controversy about whether vitamin D2 is effective. This study kind of indicates that it is, in that four of the five vegans in Finland who took vit just five micrograms a day of vitamin B D2, which I think was the 200 international units, so much lower than what I was recommending. They took it for 11 months, and they had an increase in their lower backbone density. Of course, they were in Finland, has very little sun, and so they were probably needing it somewhat pretty badly. Uh, the other thing is that vitamin D2 doesn't last in your system as long as vitamin D3, so you have to take it regularly. You can't just take a lot for a few days and expect it to do much for you unless you're getting sun. Okay, so calcium is another issue, especially for vegans. Here's some things that can help prevent osteoporosis, weight-bearing exercise throughout your lifetime. Having a heavier body weight is actually reduces your risk for osteoporosis. Uh, adequate calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K, protein, potassium, magnesium, and boron. Adequate estrogen levels, especially for women. That can be important for some vegetarian and vegans because if women get such low fat, if they eat very, very low fat diets and start not having enough fat to produce enough estrogen, they could be putting themselves at risk for osteoporosis. And factors that can contribute to osteoporosis, high sodium and caffeine intake, smoking, too little protein, and a sedentary lifestyle. Now, if you notice, I said too little protein, not too much protein. And that, in, in the vegan health nutrition circles for many years, we've promoted the idea that osteoporosis is not a disease of calcium, not enough calcium intake, it's a disease of too much animal protein intake. So uh, there's been, that's been a very controversial position. It hasn't been very controversial in the vegan among vegan nutritionists, I mean, I've always had a problem with it, but and there's been a few others that have had that have as well. But for the most part, all the popular books and that sort of thing promote this idea. And so, I wanted to just talk about quickly a, uh, a meta-analysis that just came out that looked it looked at many many studies that com that looked at bone uh, protein intake and bone health, including bone mineral density and fracture rates. I'm going to just talk about the fracture rates in the seven cohort studies because I think that's the most important information, but all the rest of the information was pretty similar. And I'm not going to necessarily go over every single one. The, the moral of the story is that they, they've, looked at, so they've combined the, the data from seven cohort studies, and they found that, well, they didn't really combine all the data into one group of data, but they looked at it all and compared it and tried to measure out what was going on. And the, anyway, one study found that, just one study found that is animal protein intake went up, that fracture rates went up. The rest of the studies either showed no difference or in, in, uh, one showed that the risk went down. In any case, the, the meta-analysis, the authors ended up 
their paper saying, overall, the weight of evidence shows that the effect of dietary protein on the skeleton appears to be favorable to a small extent, or at least is not detrimental. Now, these are, with, these are amounts, recommended amounts of protein and, and average amounts of intake. They're not like four times the RDA, which some people could take if they're really, really loading up on protein. And so that might be a problem if they take that much protein in. But generally, the idea is that has, that has been promoted is that if you eat a lot of protein, your body excretes a lot of calcium, and studies have shown that to be the case. But the, you also absorb more calcium when you eat more protein, and that could counteract it. And in studies that have looked at what's called parathyroid hormone, which is if it's elevated, it often means that your bone is being uh, your, is excreting calcium to help your blood maintain the right calcium balance. Those studies have been, I would say, on the side of protein not causing osteoporosis, but they were short-term clinical studies or laboratory tests. So that is the latest information on that. And now something that backs that up to some extent is a, what I think is the most important study that has come out on vegans and bone bones, and that was a 2007 paper on bone fractures from Epic Oxford, and they followed 1,000 vegans and 10,000 lacto-ovo vegetarians and meat eaters for, over, for five years, and they found that vegans had a 30% higher fracture rate than meat eaters. Now, when they adjusted it for most of the variables that tend to influence fractures, they found that vegans had 30% higher rate. But then when they adjusted it for calcium intake as well, they found that vegans did not have a higher rate. So what they found out when they test, te teased out the data was that among the vegans who got 525 milligrams of calcium a day or more, the vegans had the same fracture rates. But of the, of the vegans who got less, they had higher rates. And only 55% of the vegans had calcium intakes that high, whereas 95% of the people in the other groups, other diet groups did. So this was a pretty, well, it was a disappointing finding, an important one in, in my opinion, and there's been nothing to counteract. There's been no other study that have followed, has followed vegans. Now, if one other study came out and it, and it contradicted this, then I think that maybe this one, we shouldn't take this quite as seriously, but until there's other evidence, it seems to me very important that vegans make sure they get at least 525 milligrams of calcium a day at the very least, but I would recommend shooting for at least 700 and the RDA is about 1,000 for most adults. Well, it is 1,000 for most adults. Then for people who are, I think it's above 50, uh, it goes up to 1,300. You know, we've often said vegans don't need to worry about calcium because animal protein is what causes osteoporosis. That does not seem to be the case for the data we have so far. The good thing is that there is a lot of calcium, in, in, especially in leafy greens, which also contain vitamin K, which helps protect bones. The thing about that, though, is that you actually do have to eat the greens to get the calcium out of them. So if you think that you're getting the calcium from greens, make sure you eat them. And also note that the calcium in, in spinach, Swiss chard, and beet greens, although those foods do have high amounts of calcium, they're not well absorbed because they bind with oxalates and get excreted. And also note that the calcium in the other leafy greens are absorbed about the same as cow's milk and soy milk at about 25 to 30 percent of the calcium. The US DRI, the DRI has replaced the RDA for many nutrients. And actually the RDA is considered a DRI right now. So the DRI is really the term people should be using, but it hasn't really caught on so much. It's 1,000 milligrams for 19 to 50 year olds. Vegans should try to get 700, and I suggest three options. One is three servings of greens, which is a, a cup and a half of cooked, or how any, however much raw would equal a cup and a half if it wasn't uh, if it was cooked. So I think it's usually about three to four cups of raw greens. Or, or one eight ounce glass of fortified soy milk or orange juice, or three to 500, a three to 500 milligram supplement each day. If you do one of these three things, your calcium intake as a vegan should be higher than, well, you know, definitely higher than 525. Most soy milks now are fortified with, with calcium as well as vitamin B, vitamin D and vitamin B12, so you can get it easily from soy milk if you're interested in drinking soy milk. Iodine is a, more of a problem for people who do not live near the ocean, so once again, people in Hawaii, are, vegans in Hawaii probably don't have to worry too much about iodine. It's needed for a healthy thyroid, and if vegans are low on iodine, and they eat soy especially, soy can counteract iodine, and so if you don't have enough iodine, you might find that it a problem if you're, if you're eating a lot of soy. Now, if you, eat, if you regularly eat iodized salt, then you shouldn't be having a problem with iodine. 
but I don't recommend that you start eating iodized salt in order to get it. Also, people who eat seaweed, a lot of seaweed, also are getting iodine in the seaweed. If, if you don't eat seaweed, then I would recommend an iodine supplement unless you live in Hawaii, you might not need to worry about it. But in any case, what, what the deal is with iodine in food is that it really depends what, how much iodine is in the soil. And so food grown in soil near, near the ocean is going to be higher in iodine. So if you live in Hawaii and you eat most of your food, I don't know, shipped in from the mainland or something like that, then you might not be getting it. And it, it, most uh, multivitamins have iodine, plenty of it. And so if you take one regularly, you just check to make sure it does. Otherwise, you can get a, a, a bottle of kelp pills, very cheap, like for 5 to $7, and they can last you at least a year and just take one every few days. That's what I do is just every few days I just take one. It's not nothing you have to worry too much about. Iron is an interesting issue for vegan diets because vegans tend to have as high or higher iron intakes than non-vegetarians. However, plant iron is not absorbed as well as the iron from meat. Vitamin C significantly aids in iron absorption, though it must be eaten at the same meal to increase the iron absorption. The vitamin C forms a, ch a chelate with the iron that allows you to, to absorb it. Good sources of vitamin C besides orange juice is potatoes, broccoli, cauliflower, and many fruit juices are now fortified with vitamin C. If you are having, if you do happen to have iron deficiency anemia, I recommend seeing a, if you think you have it, I recommend seeing a doctor to see if you really do. That can save you a lot of time worrying about something that's not there. But if you're having a stubborn case of iron absorption that does not respond to iron supplements or vitamin C, then L-lysine is an amino acid that also helps in iron absorption. So there's more details at veganhealth.org articles slash iron. If you just go to veganhealth.org, you can just look at it. There'll be a link to iron. And so if, if this is any sort of issue for you, I have a lot of information there about it. Okay, so vitamin E. It's pretty easy to get on a vegan diet, except you have to make the effort to make sure you're doing it. Vitamin A is made from beta carotene. And for men, for women, it's 700. Men is 900. And as you can see, you can easily get it from a cup of carrot juice. Many times IRA, you can probably get it from well, less you know, less than half a, a cup of carrot juice a day. And these other foods have it as well. So just make sure you're. What I do is I keep some carrot juice on the refrigerator, and I drink at least a quarter of a cup a day to make sure I'm getting enough vitamin A. Vegetarians do not need to combine protein sources at each meal to get a complete protein because your body stores amino acids that you eat throughout the day and uses them as necessary. However, I do think it's good to include legumes like two to three times a day because they are the highest source of protein on vegan diets and that will help you reach, make sure that you get enough protein. Uh, vegan athletes have slightly different needs, possibly, and I have a number of articles at veganhealth.org if you're interested in what vegan athletes need. It is possible for vegans to not meet protein needs, and I like to bring this up because there's also an idea in vegan nutrition circles that say that, there, you know, I've, I've heard people who, who promote a vegan diet say that there's no one in the U.S. that is suffering from protein deficiency. And that is simply not true. In any case, here are the ways that vegans might not meet protein needs. If you're not eating enough calories, for one thing, uh, such as in these, these problems, anorexia, depression, dieting, if you have any of these issues, you should definitely try to make sure you're eating a higher percentage of protein than you normally would. If most of the junk, uh, food you eat is junk food, then you're not going to be getting enough protein unless it's very high-protein junk food, which these days you can actually get quite a bit of high-protein vegan junk food. But if it's french fries and soda, then you need to worry about it. Of course, you shouldn't be eating like that anyway. But I know vegans who have eaten like that, and they get, often get colds and things like that, and part of it could be just not having enough protein to fight off infections. Okay, so then if you don't think that protein is important, such as some fruitarian diets or some raw foods diets, not all by any means, but in some, or if you avoid legumes, so you don't like to eat them or for some reason, then you need to think about how you're going to get protein in other ways, and often soy foods are an easy way to do it. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to soy. I get the, by far the most questions I get oh, when people email me is about soy. At least half of what I get is about soy. So I want to touch on that, and this is the last big issue I'm going to touch on. Soy in the thyroid, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't have enough iodine, soy could become a problem. But studies have shown that if you do have enough iodine, then soy does, is not a problem. So that kind of sums it up pretty quickly. Okay, soy and breast cancer, that has been a lot more controversial over the years. Just recently, we've been getting better information about rates of breast cancer for people who eat different amounts of soy. 
So the question is, some people say that soy could prevent breast cancer, some people say soy could cause breast cancer, and that's because soy has things called isoflavones, which are considered to be plant estrogens, and what they do is they can attach to estrogen receptors on your cells, and then they they do not make the, the cell respond as strongly as if it was a normal molecule of estrogen, but it has a weak estrogen effect. Now, some people think that this could dull, dull the regular ep- estrogen, and some people think it could increase the problem if you have a lot of soy. And then some breast cancer is actually estrogen positive, estrogen receptor positive, which means that estrogen is actually causing the, the cancer to grow. And so f- particularly for women with those type of cancers, it, it's been a pro- an issue about whether soy is harmful or helpful. In 2006, a meta-analysis was published looking at the 17 studies that had looked at soy and breast cancer and followed women over time, and they found that women with the highest soy intake had slightly lower risk of breast cancer. And the largest intake was only one serving per day, which is a lot less than what many vegans eat, which I would guess is probably closer to two or three servings a day. But in 2009, the Shanghai Women's Health Study just released uh, results, and they found that among premenopausal premenopausal women, three servings per day of soy was actually pr- protective. So these women were eating a lot more soy, so they were able to figure out what, what that was doing. And in fact, these women, with, at three servings a day, they had about half the risk of the women in the lowest soy group, and this finding was highly significant. So it seemed to be a, I think it's a convincing finding. And then I just, just a couple days ago, they released more results from that Shanghai Women's Study, and they found that women with estrogen positive breast cancer were also uh, not, soy was not a problem for them as well. They, they teased out that part of the study. Four studies have looked at breast tissue biopsies uh, with, of women who eat a lot of isoflavones compared to those who don't and found no difference from a higher isoflavin intake. And then two studies have looked at women's survival after breast cancer diagnosis in women who eat different amounts of soy and found that there was no reduced survival from soy after a breast cancer diagnosis. So it really seems that soy is not a problem for breast cancer. At least that's evidence we have, have so far. Okay, soy and dementia. In 1999, you may have heard of this since it came out of Hawaii, tofu was linked with lower cognitive function. Now this caused a big uh, kerfuffle, I would say, in the uh, vegan community because we didn't know what was going on with that. And I know that Dr. Harris took uh, samples from soy from tofu products and found higher levels of aluminum that then were healthy. I don't know if that was a cause or not, but in, in any case, this was one finding. Here's some other findings. 2008, an Indonesian study found tofu linked to slightly worse memory, but they found tempeh linked to slightly better memory. And then the authors in the study go on to state that the, t- the tofu in Indonesia uses formaldehyde for processing which is very damaging to the ner- to the brain. So that could be the reason and likely is. And I looked this up because that sounded so bizarre. And I did find articles on the internet of people uh, trying to get the government of Indonesia to stop doing this. And so it does appear to be really true, which I didn't necessarily doubt it when it was the authors put it in their in their paper, but it does seem pretty crazy. Other studies have linked soy to better cognitive function, and a study of Seventh-day Adventists, many of whom have consumed soy foods their whole lives, showed lower dementia in old age than the general population. So it seems like as a whole, soy probably doesn't have a, a bad effect on dementia unless you're eating formaldehyde with it. So... Okay, so other soy issues that may be protective against heart disease. It seems that the proteins in soy are, are less likely to to promote the production of the bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. So that can be one of the reasons why it protects against heart disease, as well as, you know, being a substitute for for meat in the diet. Uh, Prostate cancer, osteoporosis, and menopausal symptoms, maybe uh, soy may protect against. Tempeh is a particularly good source of absorbable zinc. Some vegan diets are low in, in zinc, and so that's a good way to get it. Of course, people have soy allergies, and if you have a, a soy allergy, you will want to avoid soy. And I like to point out, some people do feel better eating soy foods. Other people feel worse eating soy foods, possibly due to an allergy or intolerance. It just really depends. And I also want to point out that you don't need soy to be vegan. The vegan movement does not hinge on soy. Uh, there were not many soy foods many years ago when Bill Harris first became vegan, right, in 1964. Certainly not the amount of soy products there are now. 
you can find so many of. And we could go back to not using soy for so much stuff if necessary. Uh, but it doesn't really seem like there is a reason for that. And two to three servings a day, at least for the, inf the data we have now, seems to be safe. On veganhealth.org, I have a page of real vegan children. These are children whose mothers were vegan when they were uh, pregnant and vegan during uh, breastfeeding, and then these kids have been vegan their whole lives. And so you can go look at, uh, look at them to see real, true life uh, stories of kids who were formed completely by plants and know that it's healthy. And a lot, of, a lot of people, unfortunately, I meet a lot of people while out leafleting for vegan outreach that say that they've stopped being vegan because they got pregnant. And I think in some cases, you know, they get a lot of pressure from their family and friends and even doctors to, to stop being vegan. So if you know anyone that's getting pregnant and is, is worried about that, send them to this page. And there's also another page giving recommendations, of course, pregnant women. Okay, so if you're transitioning to a vegan diet, here's what I, some suggestions I have for people. One is to base your meals around uh, one of each of these foods, legumes, which are, uh, of course, dried beans, peanuts, peas, lentils, and soy foods, grains, fruit, and a yellow and green vegetables and nuts. So if you have some of that in each of your meals, you should be doing pretty good. It should be satisfying and healthy. Eat plenty of unprocessed foods, and if you have a high metabolism and find that you can't keep up your weight on a vegan diet, then think about eating some processed foods like oils, pastas, and like drinks like smoothies. If you want any information, I, I go into more detail about all the things I've talked about if you can believe there's more details on all this stuff than what I've went over, at veganhealth.org. And you can email me through that site. And then I have a blog at jacknorsrd.com that anytime I change anything of any, of any importance on veganhealth.org, I send out a post to everyone that's subscribed, letting them know about the research that just came out. So please feel free to subscribe to that. And that's all. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you. Yes, yes. The question was, do I think that people living in Hawaii, vegans living in Hawaii need to supplement with vitamin D? No, I don't think that, if, unless you don't go in the sun without sunscreen ever, I mean, you need to do it 10 to 15 minutes every, at least every other day. If you don't do that, then yes, you should, you should supplement with vitamin D. But I... You know, it's really easy to, to do that here, it seems to me. But if you have a job where you just can't get outside, your body does store extra amounts of vitamin D. So if you're out, if you're out a lot uh, in the sun on the weekends and your, sun, and your skin actually gets red from the sun, then you probably have enough to last you through the week. Okay, the question was, I recommended 30 minutes of sun for, uh, for older people. And he said that his dermatologist would not recommend that because of, of skin cancer, obviously. I, you, you know, the general recommendations are go to just short of getting your skin red. So I think that that's what you should go by. What, if you know, because people are very different. People with dark skin are going to need longer amounts, and some people can be in the sun a lot longer, and other people can't. So, yeah, I don't... I, um, I, that's what I would recommend, and, and it hasn't. I, it, ha, it is a, a tough situation, and that's I think why there's so much vitamin D deficiency these days is because people put on sun, sunscreen be, to prevent skin cancer, which is seems to be a good thing, to, a, a reasonable thing to do. Jim, did you were you next? I think. Okay, Jim said that he's seen reports that 80 to 90 percent of cancer is due to lifestyle, and the studies that I showed don't seem to correlate to that now. Smoking is a big part of that. Smoking is linked to many forms of cancer, not just lung cancer. So once you take, and, and when we looked at those people, the, the rates of smoking were very low and they adjusted for smoking. So basically they took smoking out of that equation. Uh, so that right there is going to be a lot of it. Then um, alcohol could be, alcohol could be a, a reason for some of the cancer as well that they've adjusted, tried to adjust out. And then really high sodium diets can cause stomach cancer. And so those have been, I don't, well, actually I don't, I don't know that they adjusted out for that, but I'm guessing that those populations of people ate about the same amount of sodium. They weren't eating large amounts like in some countries. So, you know, I have a paper on, um, linked to on veganhealth.org under a, an article called 
it's like cancer and vegetarianism, and it talks about all the, the foods that have been linked to cancer and what amount of evidence there is for, for them. And it's done by the researchers that do EPIC along with a few others. And a couple of those guys are vegans, so they're definitely not just biased against vegans in that group of people. And, and so, you know, the estimates that 80 to 90% of cancer is lifestyle, you know, that could, could also t be chemicals in the environment and things like that, not necessarily only food. And it could be that vegans do have much lower rates of cancer. Like, I was talking about vegetarians here because there just haven't been enough vegans studied. I mean, my hope is that vegans will have much lower rates of cancer when, that, when those results start coming out, and then we'll know more. But right now, we, we just don't know. We can only guess what might be the case. The question was, could the funding sources of these studies influence the results? And then the next question was, what about societies that have been vegetarian for many generations? So the first part, most of the studies I've referenced, I don't think that there's any bias going on, because like I said, there are a couple of vegans involved in a great number of those studies. And in the other ones, like you, the studies list who, who sponsors them, they're, they're supposed to list it at the end. And so you can see if the National Dairy Council is who funded it. And so if that's the case, I'm not going to, you know, I would, I would uh, note that and point it out. And in nothing that I talked about tonight, was, it, was that the case where a major source was the meat industry or the dairy industry? Uh, now, there may be some researchers that have certain, you know, biases and things like that. And they try, they try to take that out in ways uh, of the r reports. But my, my impression is that what I've presented tonight, you know, there may be some soy industry funding for some of the soy studies I talked about. But other than that, I, I think it's all been pretty people doing the best science that they can. Now, in terms of societies that have been vegetarian, I've, there have not been studies following societies that are vegetarian and weeding out the veg, how the vegetarians do against the non-vegetarians. So there just isn't data on that. You can look at societies that have lower rates of uh, animal product consumption and see how they compare to groups of people that have, uh, that have less rates of animal product consumption. And it does se seem to be that the countries with lower animal product consumption have lower rates of many of the chronic diseases. But, but I was looking at actual vegetarians and comparing them to non-vegetarians, and that to me is tell more telling about the, the actual diet versus what else might be going on in those countries. In other words, they may have different, many different things, many different lifestyle factors or genetic factors. I hope that answers the question. I've never seen a database that included iodine in, I mean, almost every, not every, but almost every nutritional database actually takes the info from the USDA because it's such a big body and, and they update it regularly. So, and in fact, you may know more about the USDA database than I do because I know you've, you've, you've done a lot with it on your own, but I don't know of anything that lists iodine levels, I'm afraid. There are estimates about seaweed that I've found. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jack, for such a, for a really illuminating talk. I think we've all learned a lot. And thanks to all of you, too, for coming tonight. We invite you to come out to the courtyard now and get some really great refreshments from down to earth. Thank you all again, and happy holidays. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.